Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is the Authority. Hello, this week on The Authority, we're going to be talking about the great Greek uh, playwright Sophocles. And uh, we're moving on a bit in time. Last week we talked about Homer, and he was a few hundred years earlier. So Sophocles was born in 496 BC, so still almost uh, 500 years before uh, the birth of Christ. But you know, we've got a few more pieces of the jigsaw puzzle now because we're a bit closer to our own time. Um, so he was a contemporary of the other great uh, playwright, um, Aeschylus, um, about 16 years younger than Aeschylus, but would actually live a long life and would actually outlive uh, Aeschylus because he uh, softly lived to be 90 years uh, old. Um, so he dies about 50 years after Aeschylus, who died young. So, you know, 90 years is a long time in history. A lot can happen in the space of almost a century. So he witnessed the rise and decline of the Athenian Empire. So the rise of, of, of Athens as a great power, uh, a great center of civilization, but also its decay and its decline. He died in around 406 or 405 BC. So the whole of that uh, uh, 5th century BC, uh, he, he, he was basically alive. Now, he's known best for, for three plays that are um, connected together, the same characters in them. Um, they're sometimes called the Oedipus Cycle. I think Americans sometimes say Oedipus. You'll have to forgive me. We're, uh, we're bilingual in the authority. Uh, we'll be, I'll be speaking British English, uh, and uh, I'm sure you'll understand. So the Oedipus Cycle. Or sometimes they're just called the three Theban plays because Thebes is the backdrop of them. And the first somewhat confusing confusing thing about, about the plays is that the order in which they've, they're, they, they're written, the order of composition, is not actually the same as um, the order of the story. So uh, the first to be written uh, is uh, Antigone. Uh, and, and that was written about 442 BC when, when um, uh, Sophocles was about 54 years old, so mid, middle-aged. Um, and then the next play was written about 12 years later, around 430 BC, is Oedipus the King or Oedipus Rex. Um, and uh, um, Sophocles was about 66 years old when he wrote that. Um, and then the final play, Oedipus at Colonus, was not actually performed until after he died. It was written when he, when he was an old man. Um, so his final, final last will and testament, if you like, um, uh, it can be, can be seen in that play. And it's unfortunately the play that's least known of the three. And it's the most profound in terms of theology, philosophy, uh, the mystery of suffering, and the closest, I would say, morally of the three plays to to a Christian understanding of things, which is probably why it's not taught so much in the secular world. Um, so, but, so the thing is that in terms of that's them, they were written Antigone first, Oedipus Rex, and then Oedipus at Colonus. But the story uh, is actually Oedipus Rex comes first, where uh, 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 Antigone, the, 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 who's a, a young woman in the play of that name, is a girl. Uh, a child, the Oedipus Rex, and then and then Oedipus at Colonus is when uh, Oedipus is now an old man, uh, and uh, uh, Antigone is, is 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 his guide. She's now a young lady, and then Antigone, the play, which was the first one written, is the last in terms of the story. That's when she returns home after the death of her father. Um, so that's a little bit of confusion there, and there's always a question about what order you, you're going to. Uh, talk, discuss about, discuss them, teach them, read them, um, and I'm going to read them in the order in which they were written. Uh, uh, so you just have to bear in mind that the story we're talking about is is actually the the sequel uh, to uh, to the two the next two plays. And the reason I, I, I'm going to teach it first, I think what we you know this is called the authority. We're we're trying to focus on the authorial authority, uh, who the author is 
what the author believes, uh, how those beliefs are present in the works, um, uh, and 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 so reading that, discussing the works in the order in which they were written allows us to go through biographically as as uh, as Sophocles gets older and wiser. So Antigone, there's a, there's a, a vibrancy about it. I almost say youthfulness about it, although Sophocles was was middle aged when he wrote it. Um, Basically, uh, the scene for the play is that Antigone's two brothers, Polynices and Eteocles, are on opposite sides of a, of a war. Um, and um, Eteocles' side wins, but both Eteocles and Polynices, both the brothers, are killed in battle. So Creon becomes king. Uh, and what Creon decrees... Uh, as head of state in his in his the power secular power that he has is the law of the state um is is going to de decree that although Ateocles will have a full military funeral with all the honors that, that that go with that to a hero who died for his country that Polynices as a traitor would have no burial at all there would be no religious service uh, uh, and uh, he would just be left to to rot and be eaten by the wild dogs and 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 the carrion. Um, now, the, 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 in other words, the law of the state is uh, imposing uh, laws which uh, contravene the right to religious liberty, the right to religious freedom. And Antigone responds basically by saying to King Creon, "You have no right." The, 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 the laws of man have no right to supersede the laws of God or the laws of the gods uh, and that it's it's incumbent upon the living to give uh, a religious burial to the dead uh, and that nobody no government no 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 no, no politics uh, has the right to contravene that religious liberty so so she is going to defy the law um, in order to in, in order to practice her religion. Her sister Ismene's response is one of cowardice. Uh, she sort of agrees that Antigone's sort of right in principle, but look, it's the power of the state. What can we do against the power of the state? It's much more powerful than we are. There's nothing we can do. So just, you know, just live with it. Uh, and 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 Antigone, far from being willing to live with it, is is willing to die for her religious freedom. So she gives uh, uh, her brother a religious burial as best she can um, uh, and is caught in the process. And to cut a long story short, that eventually she, she dies. Uh, because of that, um, she lays down her life for her faith, faith, if you like. She's a martyr to her religion and a martyr against uh, secular tyranny. It goes without saying that the, the, that this is applicable. One of the great things about great works of literature, even if they were written two and a half thousand years ago, is they are applicable to our own time. They apply to us. So there are great lessons we can learn about our own time from these writers from other times. There's a dis there's a, a division between Creon and his son Hamon. Hamon's in love with Antigone, so the plot thickens, as they say. But but Hamon gives some wonderful. Uh, uh, speeches uh, in, in his in his uh, dialogue with his father about the fact that the, no one agrees with you. You're a tyrant, and the only reason that people are not are not disagreeing with you is because they're 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 uh, scared to speak up. That the power of the state has become a monster, basically, and you, as the power of the state, have become monstrous. Uh, and Creon refuses to listen to 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 to, to Haman. Um, Haman commits suicide. Uh, it, Creon's wife commits suicide. It's a Greek tragedy after all. Everybody commits suicide. Um, uh, uh, obviously, uh, Antigone dies, and then Creon, uh, too late, realizes his mistake. Um, uh, he's left devastated. He's left with nothing. He's left without his wife, his son. Um, so he pays a huge price himself for his own wickedness. So the so the key thing about Antigone is, of course, that it's a great, uh, if you like, parable. Uh, about uh, the, uh, the the uh, the conflict always between, as Saint Augustine would say, between the city of God and the city of man, between the things of God uh, and the, the the things of world of the world, secular power 
versus uh, all power and glory being 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 to God. So this is something that in every generation we face, right? That this this tension where the state tries to impose its secular will upon the practice of religion. So Antigone, the play, um, uh, stands as a, a, a monument, if you like, to this this battle for religious liberty through the ages. Let's now move on to the second play in the cycle. Um, uh, um, oh, by the way, I should, I should just mention that, 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 that there's the appearance of Tiresias the prophet, who's a blind prophet. Uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, towards the end of, of Antigone. And the key thing there is that he is a, a spokesman for the gods, right? He's a prophet. Uh, he's blind, but he sees. This is the paradox. He, he sees the future. He sees the consequences. He sees the fact that, that the kingdom uh, and Creon will be punished if they continue to defy the will of the gods. So he's the spokesman of the gods who warns Creon of the consequences he will suffer. And Creon in his pride and arrogance treats the prophet with contempt. So again, parallels with the Old Testament are, are palpable here. Um, so, but again, the, the blind prophet who sees. And of course, this is also a prophecy of what's going to happen in the next play. So in e Oedipus Rex, um, uh, we see uh, that it's a comedy of errors or comedy of coincidences that are pose questions about the meaning of suffering. Is there a meaning to suffering or is suffering just meaningless? This, so Oedipus Rex is, again, like much great literature asks some of the most important questions, particularly that concerning the role of suffering in life. So the king and queen, Laius and Jocasta, uh, hear that they, 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 there's of a curse that their own son will slay them so their response to that to that prophecy that curse is to slay their own son as an infant to kill oedipus when he's a, a baby so that obviously he can't kill them so they give the baby to a servant for the servant to, to dispose of the servant in the goodness of his heart cannot bring himself to kill the baby and then the baby is discovered lying in a field where he'd been left to die uh, by a shepherd. And the shepherd uh, takes pity on the baby. So we have mercy on the part of, if you like, the poor, um, wickedness on the part of, of, of the rulers. And then he's raised by two other kings, another king, a king and queen, another kingdom, Polybus and Merope. When Oedipus, as a young man, hears uh, uh, this uh, understanding of the... Uh, of the curse that he that he he runs away because he thinks he's going to kill Polybus and Merope, who are his his adoptive parents. He doesn't know that 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 they're that they're only his adoptive parents. He thinks that his biological parents. So he runs away to avoid that curse coming true. And then he meets his real father, who basically attacks him, uh, assaults him. He doesn't know he's his real father. He kills his real father uh, in in ignorance of who he is, and then. He marries his mother, again, in ignorance of knowing who uh, uh, she is, and they have children. So we have this curse. And when, uh, when uh, Oedipus realizes, when it's all brought to light at the end of the play, this, this hideous chain of events, which has led to him doing, you know, killing his own father, marrying his mother, having children by his mother, uh, he, he plucks out his own eyes. In, in, in an act of self-mutilation and self-disgust that, you know, my eyes have, have done nothing but deceive me uh, and I'm going to pluck up my eyes. So this self-violence at the end, this self-mutilation, these, these the, uh, people being killed and, and, that, and apparently with no culpability. It's not that Oedipus, by the way, is a saint. He, he also you know, acts arrogant in many ways, but he's certainly not, he doesn't know he's killing his father. He kills a man in self-defense. He doesn't know he's marrying his mother. So um, the, the, the question that's raised by Oedipus Rex is, is this suffering all meaningless? Is it a, 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 as an example of, a, of a, a meaningless, absurd cosmos? And so that's one reason, by the way, Oedipus Rex is, 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 uh, is quite popular today uh, to, to be taught because it you know, allows people who are nihilistic and anarchic 
uh, atheistic, who don't believe in, in, in divine providence or in the power of love uh, or the power of goodness, truth and beauty to say, look, there's no meaning to anything. At the bottom of the cosmos is just meaningless suffering. Live with it or die with it. Commit suicide, whatever. But how does Sophocles deal with that issue? He deals with that issue with the next of the play, the, the final play, Oedipus at Colonus. And Oedipus at Colonus, we have Oedipus as an old man and obviously blind, because he's blinded himself, and Antigone, his daughter, who has given up any prospect of human happiness, of marriage, of having children of her own, uh, in order to lay down her life for her father to be his guide. Obviously, a blind man needs someone to guide him. So she embraces this uh, suffering, laying down her life for her father. And um, what we find in Oedipus and Antigone is this profound acceptance of suffering. And the key thing is, is you know, we can't avoid suffering. Right? Suffering is going to happen to all of us. We are going to have to carry crosses. And the only thing we have to do, the only thing we have, this choice we have to make is what do we do with the cross when we find we're carrying it? Um, do we resent it? Do we hate it? Um, or do we ask Christ to help us carry it? Um, so again, uh, all of us are on Golgotha, either side of Jesus Christ, uh, the bad thief and the good thief. So we're on, we're on with Christ and Golgotha in the sense that we're nailing him to the cross with our sins, but we're also being nailed to our own crosses uh, because of our sins, either side of him. What do we do with the cross of suffering in our lives? Do we resent it? Do we hate it? Do we blame everybody else, including God himself, for it? Or do do we, as, as the bad thief does, or do we, as a good thief does, accept and embrace the fact that we are sinners, that much of the suffering in our lives is, is, is a consequence of our sin, the sins of others, and instead of hating and resenting it and blaming others, uh, we ask God for help, uh, like the good thief. So basically that question, the perennial question about the meaning of suffering is, is addressed and in some sense answered in this wonderful play, Antigone, sorry, and, uh, uh, Oedipus at Colonus, because both Oedipus and Antig Antigone don't just suffer, they accept suffering and embrace their suffering. And, and Oedipus says that, uh, that he's, again, he's gained great wisdom through his suffering. And the fact that he was largely innocent uh, of his suffering uh, hasn't made him resentful. He sees the, 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 the lessons it's taught. The, uh, he was proud. He's now learned humility. He's become wiser and closer to the gods. Uh, he's a, now a symbol and an image of the acceptance of suffering itself, which makes him a gift. And he says that I am a gift to those who accept me. And we go back to the law of Xenia here with uh, uh, the Greek law of, of, of um the, the responsibility of the host to be hospitable to the guest, to the stranger. Well, what that that might be fine. The stranger's wealthy and well dressed and uh, and well mannered. What about the stranger's a beggar, a blind beggar, an old man, um, homeless, probably dishevelled, maybe smelly, and same thing with Antigone, his guide. How do we accept that sort of stranger? And so, so again. Um, uh, Theseus, uh, the king, embraces, uh, welcomes uh, uh, Oedipus and Antigone as, as 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 gifts, as gifts from God, uh, as 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 um, carriers of great wisdom, and he passes the test of Xenia. He does the will of the gods. Creon, uh, on the other hand, treats Oedipus and Antigone with contempt. Look at them. And as for Antigone, look at her. Who's going to want to marry her now? I mean, she, uh, she's made a mess that she is, unlovable, right? Untouchable, a pariah. And then how do the gods um, respond? And this is really amazing because uh, Oedipus knows that his time has come, uh, the end of his life. Uh, 
if his earthly life has come, and he asks everybody to to stand back, and there's just just one witness, and he wanders off, and he's assumed into heaven by the gods. Um, uh, it's, it's it's you know Christians, Catholics cannot help but be um, reminded of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary that he's actually taken up by the, he doesn't die he's taken up into the gods as their acceptance of his acceptance of suffering and if you like the acceptance of suffering if is a, is 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 a, a synonym for holiness. Uh, there is no holiness without self-sacrifice. There is no holiness without um, uh, without suffering. To love is to sacrifice ourselves for others, to lay down our lives for others. So, you know, we, we might think that, that ancient Greece and um, this uh, this this culture that hasn't yet seen Jesus Christ and His message to us. Um, uh, would not know about suffering, would not have thought about suffering, would not have contemplated suffering. Um, uh, and evidently, of course, all generations of humanity from the beginning of time, so since, the, since the fall of man himself, have suffered and thought about suffering. We made an image of God. We've been given the power uh, uh, to love, given the power to reason, um, and so clearly people have thought philosophically, you know, again, that we need to remind ourselves that, that, um, that, uh, Sophocles is, is at the same sort of time as the great Greek philosophers, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc. very philosophical culture. They're asking these questions and that it's not, it, what we find is that these questions are answered by Christ. Um, so at the end of a, a novel, we'll be looking at some stage in the future in the authority when we come to G.K. Chesterton, the question asked at the end uh, of the person who is God is, have you ever suffered? And the character who's the divine figure in the novel says, can you drink of the cup of which I drink? Can you drink of my cup, the crucifixion? the God who lays down his life for us to make sense of suffering. So to, to conclude the three plays, Antigone teaches us very powerful lessons. And of course, again, this reminds us of the chronology. The story of Antigone happens afterwards. Oedipus dies, or is assumed into heaven. Uh, and then uh, Antigone returns uh, home. Uh, and, um, uh, and then she finds herself a uh, defying King Creon in, in pursuit of religious liberty. But in the order in which they're written, this is important, this is why we've done it this way, we see Sophocles as the author growing in wisdom, right? So seeing the the, the importance of religion and, and the, the decadence and the power of tyrannical states as being something inimical to the truths of religion and we have to fight for religion. And then looking at suffering, and what on earth is the meaning or purpose of suffering? What if someone were to find themselves in a situation where uh, they, 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 they become the victim of things beyond their control and, 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 and suffer greatly in consequence of that? What does that say about suffering? Is there any purpose? And then in the final play, uh, Oedipus at Clonus, that question is answered. Sophocles now is an old, wise man coming to see that yes we will suffer yes uh we have to respond to suffering we can do it with anger or we can do it with acceptance that uh sophocles shows us in the character of oedipus and in the character of antigone the necessity of the acceptance of suffering this is a great lesson that this great pagan playwright from, in my judgment, the greatest playwright uh, in the history of Western civilization, except for William Shakespeare, who will obviously come to eventually in the authority also. So on that note, we'll, we'll, we'll remind ourselves how I concluded last week uh, when we, we talk about Homer, about the virgin muse, about the, 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 the Greeks being um, like a bridegroom awaiting the, sorry, like a, 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 a bride awaiting the coming of the bridegroom. Here we see it. Uh, in, a, in a sublime degree in, in the way that Sophocles looks at these 
key issues of suffering and acceptance in these three plays. And next week uh, on The Authority, we'll be looking at the last uh, great uh, of the pagan writers coming at the end of the of the era, just a, a couple of decades before the birth of Christ, the great Roman poet Virgil. And we'll be looking at how he is part of a living tradition and owes so much of, of what he writes to the works of Homer. But that's next time. Thanks so much for joining me this time. And until next time, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.